Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what part of this big spinning blue ball you are tuning in from. Welcome to How to Drive Value with Tableau Server, a guide for Tableau developers. I am your host, Adam Luckroth. I'm with Tessellation and Data Coach. A few quick housekeeping items before we get uh, before we pass it off to Aiden. If you have questions, use the Q and A module. It should be on the bottom of your Zoom screen. It says Q and A. Hopefully, that's what it looks like for you guys. If you use that, I'll almost certainly get to your questions unless there's too many. If we can't get to all of them, we'll answer them offline. Um, feel free to use the chat. Uh, be respectful, have fun. But if you have a qu ask a question there, I might not see it. So use the QA module. All right, quick word from our sponsors. Tessellation is a modern analytics consultancy. We enable and manage organizations, analytics, and self-service teams by educating people, optimizing technology, developing world-class products, and providing sustainable results. Also brought to you by Data Coach, where most analytics training programs lack depth. Data Coach provides wisdom. Our modern curriculum is unparalleled, comprising video lessons, hands-on exercises, and a capstone project designed around your company's data. Data Coach also offers a truly premium service, and that's one-on-one -on -one coaching. All right, to the main event, we've got Aiden Brammel with us. With a bachelor's degree in management information systems and more than four years of experience working in business analytics, Aiden has developed a true talent in Tableau Server and Alteric Server. Throughout her career, Aiden has led world-class server deployments with up to 80,000 users and security, security requirements ranging from public to highly restricted defense data. While working at a global manufacturing conglomerate, she has also hosted self-service analytics trainings for users of experience levels of all kinds. Aiden is highly engaged in the self-service analytics community and leads a local Alteryx user group in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And as a consultant for Tessellation, Aiden leads many of our server deployment data governance dashboard and product development product projects. She's also really fun to work with. I know that from experience, and it is my pleasure to introduce you all to Aiden. Aiden, take it away. Thanks, Adam. You couldn't tell he has a background in radio. <laughs> um, well, I don't know how I'll ever live up to that introduction, but I will do my best. Um, so um, as Adam said, welcome to our um, Tableau Server Guide for Developers, How to Drive Value with Tableau Server. My name's Aiden. Adam already did a great job <laughs> of explaining who I am in my background. But so I take on a lot of our Tableau server uh, projects here in addition to actually being a developer myself. So um, I this session was actually um, something that was inspired by some of the projects that I take on, but also mostly just in my background, questions that I get from developers, whether they're consultants or folks that I've worked with in the past, questions that I get all the time. Um, and uh, I, I just thought there was definitely a need for kind of, um, from the perspective of a developer, you know, understanding some of the pieces of Tableau Server. So, um, so what we're gonna go over today is we'll do an introduction to Tableau Server itself for those of you who might not be familiar with it. We'll go through the content structure, some of the roles associated with that content structure and permissions. This is something that I think is super important for every developer to understand because ultimately you're not ever sharing your content with no one. Um, you always need to be able to partition uh, those permissions and kind of understand how folks will end up accessing those in the end. Um, we'll then talk about publishing to Tableau Server, things that you should consider before publishing to Tableau Server. We'll walk through doing that and then doing some automation, um, you know, how to schedule those refreshes and set up things like email alerts. All right, so what is Tableau Server? So Tableau Server is really just the web-based hosting platform for all of your Tableau reports. So it enables you as creators to securely share and automate any kind of dashboards, visualizations, data sources, um, that you might need to share out with to others. Um, it's where you can go and publish also data sources. A lot of folks use um, Tableau Server as a way to enable folks to 
um, uh, do some ad hoc analysis and exploration on some kinds of data sources that might exist at the company. Um, it's also really nice because there's really no need for any additional creator licenses in order for folks to reap the benefits of your um, the fruits of your labor, you know, the, the hard work that you do on the, the, the workbooks that you build. Um, they don't need to download it. They don't need any kind of like reader license um, with Tableau server. Um, they can just uh, consume them as long as they're given access. Um, so what does that look like if they are given access? We're going to do a quick overview of kind of navigating Tableau server. So um, signing in and understanding the general project structure before we jump back in to our PowerPoint. Um, just want to give you guys some background before I start throwing some kind of terminology at you and before we kind of dig a little bit deeper into what that means and what permissions look like. So I'm going to go over to my uh, Tableau online instance that we have here at Tessellation. Um, some of you might be looking at this and think, you know, that looks a little bit different than my server. There's probably a few reasons for that. One, because Tableau Online is always as up to date um, as a server can be. Many organizations choose to keep their Tableau server um, a few versions backward um, just to ensure things like maintenance releases, any kind of bugs that have been come out. Um, so, so you may have something that looks a little bit different than this, but the general structure will remain the same. The other reason you might see some things that you wouldn't normally is specifically down here. Um, if you don't have um, more than like a site admin or, or server admin, which we'll talk about in a second here, if you don't have like a higher level of access, you might not see some of the administrative panel, but the rest of this should remain pretty similar. Um, so on your homepage here, you will see um, kind of an overview of some of the tabs that we see here on the top. So you will see things like any kind of favorite. So if you've starred dashboards that you look at most frequently, um, that will show up right at the top for your ease of use. You'll also see um, anything that you may have accessed recently. So it looks like I've been looking at that same dashboard mockup as well as a metric that would be available if you have the data, um, the data management add-on um, and a few other dashboards, very cool, um, as well as any recommendations. So if I have access to something that's really trending right now or um, that a lot of people are looking at, um, it's going to uh, um, say, hey, maybe this is something that you'd be interested in as well, based on some of the stuff you've looked at before. Um, there's also some sample dashboards that you might see at the bottom here as well to kind of get started with developing. Um, you can dig deeper into any one of those panels by clicking on you know, that favorites panel here, um, recents, um, and then anything that might've been shared with you explicitly will also show up here, uh, that same recommendation window. Um, I'm just going to gloss over this pretty quickly because I think a lot of you probably won't have um, uh, some of these features available yet. For example, personal space is something that has just recently, I believe in the last week, been updated to. But this is potentially where you would be able to go ahead and publish out some of your own personal workbooks before actually sharing them into some of the folder structures we'll talk about in a second. And then collections are also where you can kind of group together different data sources for your own reference. Um, where we're going to spend 90% of our time talking about today is this explore tab. Um, and so the explore tab basically is your directory for all of the content that exists on Tableau server. So here you can see we've got several different um, what's called top level or parent projects here. So um, you can also say, you know, I maybe I, I, I don't necessarily need to see the folders. I just want to see um, any of the metrics or any of the prep flows that might exist. We could also do that. But by default, you're, you're pretty much always going to get sent to this top level projects. Um, if I drilled, let's say, into our samples here, um, there can also be um, sub projects. So um, you kind of have an additional folder structure within your folder. Um, pretty much everything on Tableau Server, other than this brand new uh, personal space that I just mentioned over here, um, all of the shared content on Tableau Server is going to be in one of these folders, which we refer to as projects. Um, and the kind of content that might exist within these folders includes these are metrics, which are um, uh, key data points that you can pull out from a published data source to track individually. Um, these are some dashboards that we have published. Um, there are some um, lenses, which for if you're familiar with the ask data function, we're not going to spend too much time on for today. Um, but the lenses are kind of filtered down versions of public data sources, or excuse me, of published data sources for folks to do some ad hoc analysis in. And then there's some actual published data sources and prep flows here. If I were to actually, you know, click into um, uh, one of these, you'll see I've got several new features, or excuse me, several uh, different, uh, I'll see several different views that are in here. 
these are just the dashboards that you've chosen to publish out um, within each of these workbooks. You know, you'll see um, the data sources that are associated with it. If there's any kind of metrics, um, uh, if there's any metrics that might be um, uh, associated with that data source, um, and then any kind of custom views, which, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, the other thing to note is that permissions, which we'll talk about quite a bit here in just a second, can be handled at any one of these objects. Um, let's go up to the top project object here. Um, and permissions can be handled by clicking the ellipses and then going to permissions. And here is where you can go in and you can see, you know, if I wanted to see whether or not Adam had access to something, I could go ahead and I could search Adam's name here. Uh, looks like he does have access to be able to see this project. Uh, if I found that there was someone that I wanted to have access who didn't, maybe I wanna share this with the whole Active Directory group, I could go ahead and I could add it there. Um, so that's just a little bit of background into what um, Tableau Server looks like as an interface. Wanted to get you familiar with kind of what we're talking about from a practical level before we jump in and actually talk about tactically what that looks like and kind of the strategies that I'd recommend um, as, you're, as you're sharing out within this uh, folder structure. So let's jump back into our PowerPoint and just kind of keep that in mind of how that might practically look as we jump through um, some of the visuals that I have here. Um, so here I'm, we're taking a look at, you know, that folder structure that we just saw. So again, the kind of terminology here is that there are projects, which are basically folders, workbooks are a collection of dashboards, and the view is that dashboard or visualization. Um, so there can be those top level projects, there can be sub projects, and there can be any number of content within each of those. Um, there's also an additional um, piece of organization within a Tableau server called a site. Um, and depending on your organization, you may have one or you may have many sites. Um, and sites are basically, I think I've got, yep, here we go. So sites are basically um, just another way of completely separately organizing both content and permissions. So um, uh, we, we set um, permissions for um, kind of like the overall um, experience on a site at the site level. Um, and we add users at that level, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But so some folks like to add a completely separate site to manage that um, the permissions to that site in completely separately. So that's something to be aware of. Um, another kind of implication of adding a site is that um, if we have a published data source that exists on um, our first site, maybe we have something in the finance um, folder that's really applicable also to something on accounting. If accounting's on a separate site, we couldn't connect to that data source from the finance site um, into the accounting, um, from that accounting project because it's on a separate site. So something to keep in mind is creating those sites can duplicate some resources like that if you'd potentially have to um, jump into another one. Um, so something to consider when you're looking at organizing your own content, keeping it all on one site is usually the most effective way to go about it, um, unless you have just one, uh, um, unless you have one section of your content that's going to need to be completely separately uh, uh, handled. And an example of that would be, they talked about you know, like restricted military data or, or something of that nature. Um, if it's just needing to not provision a separate active directory group, you're still good with keeping on one site. Um, to that point, many companies will also have multiple instances of Tableau server. So if you've heard someone say like, oh, publish that out to development or publish it to the production server, um, this just means that there are two completely separate um, uh, versions of Tableau that exist in your um, deployment. And that is sort of to keep, it's often to keep your production or, or kind of uh, finished product host um, uh, of Tableau server clean from any kind of work in progress data and, and to do testing over there. So you might have a development or sandbox server as well um, in your organization that would be available for testing or work in progress uh, reports. All right, so I mentioned that um, a lot of the permissions are set actually at the site level. Um, so we can't, if we don't have permission to let's say publish at the site level, uh, we, we, we can't do that um, on a specific site. So um, I'll, I'll just go through, there's a few exceptions to where permissions are set. So one being um, the server admin. So um, if I was given server admin access, that's you know at the instance level, I've uninhibited access to pretty much everything. That's one of the key roles that pretty much every um, organization is going to have in their Tableau server. Um, so that's the kind of person that you could go to um, if you needed to set up, let's say um, you've, you've never connected to a specific kind of data source before, or maybe you need access to the server to do something specific. They're probably the person you go to because they also go, in, go ahead and, um, 
administer the back end. Um, the site administrator handles a lot more of the front end administration. So this would be, you know, if you needed a new project in Tableau Server, um, you would jump to that person and you would ask them to uh, give you a place to publish um, and, and share out into a new folder. Um, that could potentially be a time that you would be interested in being the leader of that project folder. Um, and project leaders are the administrators of that specific folder on Tableau Server. These are kind of typically uh, the champions or um, the, the expert users of the tool um, for separate uh, business groups in Tableau, depending on how you're organizing those folders. Um, but the benefit of having project leaders is that project leaders are also able to provision access to active directory groups, to users, to whoever it is. Um, so that's something to keep in mind and to potentially ask for as you are um, getting your uh, access to publish on Tableau server. Um, if you're going to be uh, publishing and sharing out your workbooks with multiple people, um, that's potentially a role that you could ask for. Many of you will end up being uh, creators on Tableau server. Who, um, uh, who are the ones who obviously create you know, the visualizations and data sources that would exist on uh, Tableau server. Um, there are also explorers, so folks who would jump in and they might grab your published data source and they might do some ad hoc analysis on that or, or create some ad hoc views for their own viewing uh, report using the web edit functionality in Tableau server. There are also viewers who just simply consume the data. Um, one more thing on permissions here before we uh, continue onward to actually kind of what this would look like if you were publishing. But so um, there is a difference um, in, in how you manage permissions based on that top level project I was showing you before on where exactly those permissions might live with content. And especially if you're sharing things out to multiple users or separate Active Directory groups, it's going to be really, really important for you to understand whether the project you're publishing to is locked or unlocked or, or customizable is the other way to refer to unlocked uh, permissions. But so um, as you can kind of see, or as I tried to demonstrate in this visual um, with the squares, those kind of indicate where you can set individual uh, permissions at. And locked permissions mean, you know, at that top project level, I've said only the specific active directory group has access, no one else can access it. Um, and that would propagate through all of the content in the workbook, and we could even decide to propagate that through any sub projects that would exist in the workbook. Um, so this is a really good way for if you know that only specific people are going to be accessing this content, um, uh, that, that, you, that you can keep that from, uh, um, from causing any kind of like discrepancies and who can see what, everyone will just have access to the content there um, based on what exists at the top level. If you do choose to do unlocked permissions, that does gain a little bit of extra um, uh, flexibility in terms of the content. However, if you ultimately decide to publish something to that finance project, you publish your finance workbook, um, and then you want to give permission to someone to that finance workbook. Um, now you're going to have to give permission to that person or to that active directory group at the workbook level at the view level and at, you know, at every other view that exists on the server. So um, that's just something to keep in mind as you go about uh, um, uh, setting up your projects or, or asking for the projects that you would like to share um, your workbooks out to. Um, I would definitely recommend going for locked permissions in almost all cases, that just being because it gives you a lot despite the name, it gives you a bit more flexibility to add people um, in for additional access as needed without needing to individually go in and you know, add them to every single new workbook, um, especially if you change after publishing, um, because the workbook, once you publish it, will only, uh, only take on the projects or excuse me, the permissions they were at um, at that given point in time. Um, so this is a much easier way if you're gonna go about being a project leader to go ahead and, and manage permissions to that content. Like I said, these can be provisioned to individuals and to active directory groups. And honestly, my recommendation at most companies would be to try, as you're kind of doing your development, consider um, putting in the requests for getting both the project and any active directory groups you need to be set up. Because things like, when I say active directory groups, some, some people also refer to those as like security groups. Um, sometimes setting up those groups can take up more time depending on what that request process looks like at your company. Um, but I do recommend uh, uh, 
using Active Directory groups as a way to leverage adding access because it, it makes that request process a little bit easier. They can just use whatever request process they're used to using for your organization. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I definitely recommend setting that up ahead of time uh, so it doesn't slow down any of your QA or release processes. Everyone will just have access and we'll have that all squared away once we're ready to publish. Um, so publishing to Tableau Server. Um, so we are going to walk through the differences um, in uh, publishing a Tableau Server for, you know, we're publishing a data source, if we're publishing a dashboard, how we access that uh, via Tableau Desktop. But I do uh, want to go through a little bit more vocabulary <laughs> before we go about doing that. And I swear it'll be important because um, there are a few distinctions that we need to think about once we push things into server that I think you're going to save you a lot of time. Um, uh, before, uh, if, if you think of these and kind of square them away beforehand um, versus, you know, having to make those changes on the fly. Um, the first you may already be familiar with, and this is just the types of connections to a data source that exists with Tableau Desktop. The first is a live connection, and this is your near real-time data. This data is stored within the source system, um, whereas an extract is a snapshot from a period of time. Um, excuse me, that can be scheduled for refresh based on whatever cadence you need to see that refreshed on server. And I'll show you how to schedule these as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can generally see some performance benefits when you use extracts because not only do, does it leverage um, the, uh, the hyper technology and, and engine that exists on Tableau um, that is shown to have performance improvements. I also apologize. It looks like they're uh, picking up the trash outside of my window. So I, I'm sorry if you hear a lot of background noise. <laughs> Um, but the other key distinction with an extract um, is that the data is stored on Tableau server. So the reason that that matters um, is from a security perspective. So extracts, while they are generally preferred due to the performance benefits, um, obviously there are some implications of it not being live data. If you need live data, live is, is going to be the best option for you. But um, in many cases, if you're using some kind of like highly secure data, um, that data might need to be stored specifically or stay within the source system. So it's important for you as you're going about developing your reports to make sure that you've engaged with whatever security or database team that you're referring to or, or whoever kind of knows the most about the data you're working with and asking whether um, there is any security requirements that, that would require, you know, the, the data to live in the source system versus being stored on Tableau server itself. Um, the other and final distinction that we will make before we jump into the tools themselves are published versus embedded data sources. Um, and this may be one that you're less familiar with, especially if you haven't used Tableau Server very much in the past. Um, so published data sources are connectable by more than one workbook. Um, and so these would be published completely separately from the workbook itself. Um, and if, um, uh, if you're actually connecting to these data sources, you'd be connecting kind of via Tableau server versus directly to the source system. So for that reason, like if you want to give someone access to ad hoc query, um, some data source on Tableau server, but not, you don't want to give them access to the source system. Um, it's a great way to enable that kind of read only access for folks to be able to uh, take a look at the data sources. Um, Published data sources are also available to be certified on server, which again, just kind of further um, implies that, that governance process and would let the, those web editors know, you know, this is a, a trusted source. Um, on the other hand, embedded data sources, um, they are only consumed by one workbook. So these are typically going to be published, well, they always are, <laughs> excuse me, going to be published at the same time as the workbook itself. Um, and it, these can only be edited if you're going to go ahead and edit and republish the entire workbook. Um, so for that reason, if you couldn't tell based on my spiel there, um, published data sources generally are preferred because um, they allow for a single source of truth on a topic rather than multiple interpretations. Um, if you have lots of companies at your organization using like financial data or, or, or uh, data out of like SAP, something like that, um, uh, you're not going to want to have multiple sources on your system that you know might calculate something slightly differently. Um, you kind of want that single source of truth. Um, it also allows for um, a little bit of a lessened load on the server itself. So you'll see some overall performance improvements um, to the server uh, if you're not kind of duplicating the effort of you know publishing the exact same data source embedded over and over and over. Um, and it also allows for a single point of editing connection details. Um, if the data source has ever, uh, like that source system has ever moved, migrated, something like that, you would only need to edit it that one time versus, you know, 
separately publishing. I think one time at a previous project, I, I this happened, we were working on a migration and I wanna say there were like 70 workbooks connected to the exact same thing, but it was just duplicate. Um, you don't want to republish all 70 of those workbooks. You 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 want to just update that one data source. So uh, that said, you know, embedded data sources should totally be used for one-off reporting. Um, this isn't, you know, something you have to always use a published one, but if you do foresee um, someone else wanting to do the same kind of analysis you're doing or, you know, digging deeper into the data, publish is generally the way to go. Um, and the easiest way for you to tell with like an existing workbook, if something is published or embedded, if you hover, hover over that data source in the workbook, if you can kind of drill in deeper where that connects to, um, if you can click in, for example, on that published one, I can see, I can drill further into that consumer sales. Um, it'll have its own separate page. Um, that, that is a good indicator to you that something's published. All right, so, Let's finally see what doing some of this actually looks like in uh, a demonstration that I have here. So I am going to pull up um, a sample workbook here and we're going to go through the activity of like publishing that, we're going to schedule that and we're going to set that up to be automatically sent to our stakeholders on a daily basis. All right, so here I have um, a very beautiful dashboard um of uh, uh basically sales by state um i'm sure that your dashboards all look a little bit better than this but we don't need anything fancy for this specifically <laughs> um in this i'm connecting to a database so we can take a look at how you know publishing with a database might look enabling that for a refresh here i'm just connected to a snowflake database um and i'm using specifically authentication with username and password um, a lot of uh, um, organizations and a lot of different data sources will probably either use something like username and password or um, Okta or OAuth. And so I'll try to call out as we go throughout this, um, since there will be some differences um, when you embed these credentials, um, how that might look depending on what kind of authentication you use. So um, I'll go ahead and call that out where I can. Um, the other thing to call out here, even though I'm on Snowflake, I did make this an extract for the purpose of this, though I will say Snowflake runs really well on live connections. But um, but so here I just want to call out some additional features that you may not be aware of before um, uh, that, that might prove to be pretty helpful for you um, once you push them out to server. So um, I'm going to, you can always add filters to your extracts if you, if you weren't aware if we click this edit button up here. But I think what I kind of wanted to focus on and make sure that I called out here um, is that with server, um, with you running um, uh, refreshes, if you're looking at, let's say, a lot of historical data, um, what's actually a pretty good option is if, you know, a lot of your information is historical, it's not going to remain the same. Um, you can also go in here um, and you can say, you know, we um, only want to do an incremental refresh. So all of our old data will stay our old data. It'll stay there historically, but we just want to append to that each time. Um, if we added like a row number or something we, we could indicate that could indicate um, new data, um, it will identify new rows and only add what would be new from your existing data set. So this is another thing to be aware of, especially as you're moving things onto server that can save some time on the back end as well. All right, so if I wanted to go ahead and publish this right now as is, um, I could sign into my Tableau server. And so here, if I just navigate up to server, here you can see I'm already signed in. But if I had not been signed in yet, you just jump in and click the sign in button. And here's where you would put your organization's sign in. You'll have a unique URL um, if you're using um, your own organizations. Otherwise, you can also just click the Tableau online button here and just sign in using the credentials you're used to using. So I'm already signed in to that. Uh, um, space that we saw beforehand. The other thing to call out here is that if I was working on a workbook that I've already published out to a server, I could also just open that. So here you can see um, it'll automatically pop up to take my workbooks. I see a lot of folks as I'm working with people at clients, I'll see a lot of folks who will go in and each time they want to open up their workbook from Tableau server, they'll uh, download it from the uh, server first. Um, but you can actually just do that straight from the um, for Tableau Server itself. Um, and you can do that either with the products that you own or really anything you have access to edit, you can go ahead and open them um, and, and search for them here. All right, so let's jump back to my, we're not gonna publish our data source yet because there's another option that we have for being able to do that that I'll show you here in a second. Um, so again, here, incredibly beautiful dashboard. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna navigate to server. And now that we're back into where our dashboard is, we can go ahead and we can click publish workbook. 
Um, and here I want to, um, uh, we're just gonna say, sure, this is our, our sample dashboard. If I want to add a description here, I'll say, um, this is a great place to put um, any kind of uh, descriptors that you might have on the workbook. If someone opens it up, it might not have as much context to it. Uh, but this is a demonstration dashboard for webinar as a webinar as of right now. Um, this is where you can also add tags. I don't see tags being used super, super often, but it is another way to be able to easily track down specific content. So if you want to be able to, this is, you know, some of sales, and this is something that has to do with sales. Um, and we want to always easily be able to find sales Then we can go ahead and we can click on um, a tag or add a new one there to, to kind of track that content specifically. You'll pick which sheets you want. Um, in this case, I have very few, but sometimes I think that we all know how big Tableau workbooks can get. So um, I usually only opt for publishing my dashboard. So picking the only dashboards here is a pretty uh, nice way uh, and a convenient way to, to just select the ones that you want. Um, here is where I want to harken back to why I gave that big spiel about permissions a few moments ago. Um, so our permissions, uh, here you can see there's a little lock here, a little latch, and it says permissions are locked by the site admin or project leader. Um, and so here we can see, you know, I, I can see the all users, I can see, you know, what, what access they have, especially if I click inspect here, I can see specifically what access each, each of these people have. Um, but I can't actually add anything here. I can't make any changes. If I wanted to make any changes, I would have to go back into the interface, do that at the project level. Um, and but that could happen before or after me publishing. Um, and because it's locked, that would all propagate down. Um, I'm going to jump into this other one that I have set up here, which is my demo unlocked. Um, and this one I have specifically unlocked so you guys can see the difference. So here you can see as of immediate, it says same as project. And we just currently have all users. Um, so if I were to publish this right now, it would come out and you know, it would be the same as the project and um, all users would be applied. But if I were to go at that project level and I were to say, want to add another active directory group to give them access, it would not propagate back down. I would have to either republish or manually assign those to each of the, of the, of the members here. So, Something to keep in mind, like I said, definitely do uh, tend to recommend against unlock permissions. Um, here, I'm going to go back. That'll that'll unselect if you change the the, um, the location. Um, again, another reason why I wanted to give us a little bit more um, information into embedded versus published. Here, you can see if I if I don't click in here, it says you know one embedded, one data source embedded in the workbook. If I click edit, I can go in and I can edit some of these details. Um, so the first being the publish type. So here I could say I want to publish this data source completely separately um, because I'm using Tableau online. It'll ask me to um, use, use bridge, which is something a little uh, that we won't get into too much today that basically just enables connections um, to uh, uh, internal resources if you have things behind a VPN, but we won't get too into that right now. Um, uh, uh, what, what I would want to do here is either, you know, this is, this is where it's, you know, helpful for you to be able to have already gone in and determined, am I going to be publishing separately or is this going to be, you know, ad hoc, simple analysis that's going to happen only one time in this only one workbook. Um, so it's a great place for you to be able to do that. We're just going to keep it embedded for now, just for the purpose of this demonstration, but this is your other option for being able to publish it separately and have multiple workbooks feed into it. Um, as far as authentication goes, so this is where I said, you know, this is going to potentially look a little bit different depending on what data source you're using. Um, by default, this is, I believe, always going to show up as refresh not enabled. So you're always going to want to go in if you do plan to um, refresh this um, and allow refresh access. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you are using um, something like OAuth, um, you might have other options in here um, to embed like a specific account, which will likely be your own account that you've authenticated with. Um, that, uh, that, that's also something that I'll show uh, just briefly how to set up uh, in, in just a second here. Um, so here, um, uh, just down here, we have a few more options. One being to show sheets as tabs. So if I had multiple dashboards that I was publishing out, we could tab between those two from one to another. Um, showing selections would just say, you know, if I had Florida clicked um, uh, when I published it, Florida will be clicked by default when you open up that workbook on server. Um, so we are going to go ahead and we're just going to publish that. Oops. 
just gonna open up our page here. All right, here it is, our incredibly beautiful dashboard um, that we have published. Here it says that we can schedule the data to refresh regularly. So we're definitely gonna wanna do that. Let's go ahead and click it. Um, and it's gonna bring us to this window here where we can choose either a full refresh or had we selected that option for incremental refresh, um, we'd also be able to set the cadence at which that happens. Um, but so here we're gonna say, you know, we wanna do um, all of our weekdays and we want to have this um, happen at let's say noon um, and we want this happening every day. So you have several different options for you know how you can choose to, to, to refresh that. But we just wanna do it every day at noon. Um, you can also set which time zone you have in here. Um, time zone is set at your own um, individual account. Um, and I'll show you in just a second where that's stored. Um, but time zone is something that, uh, that you can set for yourself. So you, you always see it in your local time. Um, so we're gonna create that schedule. And now you can see in our extract refreshes um, that we have, uh, you, you know, that, that schedule all set up here um, and it tells us when it's going to update um, and, and had it run before, it'll, it'll tell us when it last updated. Um, this would also be where you would see things like incremental, um, what we were doing full today. Um, you can also run this at any time if given permission to, um, as well as you can go in at any time, you know, change the frequency if you decide you need it more often. Um, I'm going to circle back here to what I said about um, our uh, credentials being embedded here. So here, if I edit the connection, you can see that um, we have that password embedded in here. I can always come in and I can change that and I can test the connection from there. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, circling back to what I said about OAuth before, um, if you uh, are using a dashboard that has been set up using OAuth or some other kind of like token-based authentication, um, I believe Okta would probably be similar. Um, you can head up here to your, um, excuse me, your My Account settings. And you can actually uh, take a look at all of the different credentials that you have used um, that would uh, require you know, like a token-based credential or a saved credential. So OneDrive is a good example of something that um, typically O365 will authenticate with, um, uh, with an OAuth token. Um, so that's something where you can go in and add. Um, specifically with Snowflake as well, um, this is where you would enter in um, and create a shared credential for yourself. So you can actually embed those into um, your data sources themselves. So you just enter in your um, instance of uh, um, Snowflake and you would enter the role that you wouldn't want embedded in there. Um, from there, that's when you can actually embed that credential into your connection um, and enable that refresh. Uh, like we just did um, a little bit easier with just that plain username and password. Um, so let's go back in here um, and take a look at that sample dashboard. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. If you'll remember correctly, one of our um, other kind of requirements to this, I said, was that we want to be able to also send this out to um, our stakeholders on a daily basis. Um, and so we've already scheduled this so that our um, dashboard will refresh on a daily basis. Um, but how do we make sure that they are aware once it has been refreshed? Um, there are a few different options for using these. Um, one option that you can do is you can set up data-driven alerts. So if I had any kind of access on this report, I could say, you know, if, if we get below, uh, if Kentucky gets below you know, that 1,000, I want to be alerted um, based on that condition. Uh, uh, um, and then that's what that would prompt me to go to this workbook. But if we just want to be able to see this on a daily basis, we can go and we can click subscribe. Um, and here's where you can add either you know, yourself, which, which I'll add right away, or I can subscribe um, anyone from uh, that exists on my Tableau site. So here is where I could say, you know, I want the data viz practice to always be updated on this beautiful dashboard um, uh, each time uh, that, uh, uh, that, I, that I schedule this cadence too. So, some things that you can include here are you can say you only want this to be this one view, or if we had multiple views, you know, we could we could choose to send the entire workbook. You'll always get the link to it so they can go um, take a look themselves. You can send it in either an image or a PDF or both um, format. Um, and you can customize what the, the email is going to look like once they receive it. Um, the other thing here, so we can set 
the selected schedule of when we want them to do this. And we probably want to coincide that with when that extract is running. So if that extract is going to take, let's say, 30 minutes to run, maybe you want it to run at 1230 um, on each and every one of those days. Um, Here's where sometimes some people get into a bit of a pickle with this, right? Because we don't always know how long an extract's gonna run. Maybe it's not super consistent. Maybe, it, maybe we're doing an incremental extract and you know it's gonna be inconsistent based on how much data we get that day. Um, so this is where a lot of people I think have seen some issues in the past. So um, getting um, a schedule to run based on that uh, when the refresh is done is something that uh, Tableau has been hearing um, as feedback for many years. I, I am excited to share um, that it is something that is now available. Um, for those who might not be aware. Um, so now you can schedule a frequency um, um, on here instead of you know just a selected date and time, we're taking a guess, it's gonna take 30 minutes for that data to refresh. Um, now instead we can also say, um, we are gonna send this email and it's gonna trigger a subscription once the extract actually refreshes. We're gonna click subscribe here. And now we'll have 13 subscriptions here um, to all of the myself and then all the members of that data viz group that I added to be subscribed. Um, I'm certainly going to need to unsubscribe all of those people. So I apologize to anyone on this call who may be getting an email shortly. <laughs> but now you can also see um, in our subscriptions tab that we have that full list of people who were in our data viz practice. Um, uh, some folks who no longer have access to the site, it will already show up as failed. Um, but uh, we can see here that these people would have a subscription to our incredibly beautiful dashboard. They were subscribed by me um, and these will run each time that our extract is refreshed. Um, so if, we, if anyone asks to be unsubscribed, they can always unsubscribe themselves or we can just go on and we can say, hey, Luke gets enough emails. So we are going to unsubscribe him from the incredibly beautiful dashboard. What a pain. Um, I know everyone would probably want to be subscribed to that. Um, so those are some of kind of the key features that I see a lot of folks using um, at, um, uh, at their companies and kind of that help um, them to uh, better uh, refresh and kind of serve their, uh, their end users as well as um, save themselves a little bit of time. Um, at this point, are, are there any questions that anyone has about what we've uh, gone through here today? Otherwise, um, I can always show a couple more tips as well. <laughs> that was my planned content for the day. <laughs> uh, no questions have come in yet. There has been some chat going on with me, but uh, no direct questions for you other than just uh, some, some kudos being lobbed your way, Aiden, and then some thank yous. So if, you, if you've got other things you want to show, feel free. I'll just call out a few other things that I see as being um, a bit of a, a struggle for some people as they maybe are transferring ownership to a workbook or they um, are going about um, uh, providing access to content. So one thing we already took a look and we saw that um, uh, we had stored some embedded credentials here in this workbook. Um, the other option here would be if we didn't store that, each time a user would access this workbook, they would be prompted. Um, let's say I'm doing the work for some business users um, to develop this dashboard and eventually either the business users or let's say IT is going to take over ownership of kind of maintaining this dashboard. If I wanted to say I'm going to change the owner to, to Mr. Adam himself, Adam is going to now be responsible for our incredibly beautiful dashboard, keeping it you know, incredibly beautiful. Um, one thing that Adam should be aware of now that he's the new owner is that he's probably gonna get a lot of messages from folks right away saying, um, what the heck, why is it that when I access this dashboard, let's see it in just a second here, or it's potentially cached still. Um, why is it that when I edit this dashboard, um, now we'll see that um, we no longer have that embedded password in there, um, which typically it seems that we've cached the view in there um, for just a second. Uh, oh or we're on an extract. Next time the extract runs, it will fail because it's no longer um, embedded in there. If we've had a live connection, this would just all around fail. Um, but we, every time you uh, change ownership, you are going to need to uh, re-embed the password into your connection. So something to always be aware of um, as you move from uh, owner to owner. I see we do have a question now in the chat. Yes, this webinar will be uh, recorded. So we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll send this out to anyone who's in attendance. Beat me to it, Aiden. That's my Sorry. job. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, 
so that was one of the other things that, that I see coming up here a lot. Um, uh, I, I think if there aren't any additional questions, um, uh, and I think I can click answer live here. Um, if there aren't any additional questions, um, I can probably give some folks some time back as well here. That sounds good. Thank you, Aiden. Really appreciated that. Um, for those who asked about the recording in, in the Q&A and in the chat, yes, there will be a recording and we will make sure that people get that delivered to them. For other upcoming events, go to datacoach.com or tessellationtech.io. That lists all of our, our live streams like this. But thank you, Aiden. Thank you all for joining. Hopefully you have a great rest of your day, your morning, your evening, again, wherever you are coming to us from this big blue spinning ball. All right, take care, everybody.